Welcome to our next voyage on T-10, the show with 10-minute takes on the future of education and healthcare. I'm your host, Tim Fitzpatrick. On today's voyage, you'll hear from Steve Winfrey, a fierce patient advocate, kidney transplant recipient, frequent writer, and someone I'm lucky to call a teammate at Icona. Steve had kidney disease for 13 years before starting dialysis. The video of the moment when his wife, Heather, told Steve the good news that she was a match as a transplant donor went viral and has been seen over 700 million times. That video is in the show notes. What I love about Steve is his resilience, positivity, and willingness to run through walls for his fellow patients. He's been a mentor and advocate most of his life, and it really shows. He and Heather recently signed a book and movie deal to tell their story to an even larger audience. Steve has shared his story, tips for managing kidney health, mental health, and setting goals in our community webinars. If you're a patient, family member, or a care partner listening to this, I encourage you to reach out to Steve. We are ready to go. Please enjoy my conversation with Steve Winfrey. All right, we are here with an episode I've been waiting for a long time to do. Steve, it is so good to have you on T-10. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's definitely an honor. Well, it's, uh, you know, I'm very lucky to be able to talk to you frequently in, in our capacity at Icona, but uh, I am thrilled for the T-10 world to get to know Steve Winfrey. I'd, I'd uh, appreciate it if you'd give everyone an idea of kind of who you are and obviously uh, your story and, and why we connected in the first place. Yeah. So at the age of 18, back in 2003, I was diagnosed with kidney failure. Um, the reason they caught my kidney failure is because I had really, really high blood pressure. And they caught that when I was doing my preseason physical for college basketball. And needless to say that that, that blood pressure test changed the course of my life. Um, it's taken, gosh, 19 years. 20 years for me to finally actually learn what type of disease I have. And it's something that's a genetic mutation and it's very rare. It's called uh, medullary cystic kidney disease type two. And I began dialysis at the age of, I guess I was 31. And a little over a year later, about 15 months, I was very blessed. I found a living kidney donor and I happened to call that donor my wife. Uh, she donated her kidney to me, and I'm very, very happy to say it's doing well, and it completely changed my life and truly did give me a second chance. Amazing. Steve, thank you for, for sharing, and I always learn so much every time I, I hear your story, and uh, I would encourage everyone, we'll make sure that after, please check out the show notes, we'll have links to uh, Steve's story. So when he, he I think he uh, glanced over this, but he... <laughs> His story went viral, and, and the way that he found out that Heather, his wife, was going to be his donor is uh, is just a wonderful video and, and thing for someone to watch to understand the power of of that part of your journey. So I, I know you share frequently and talk about it, and it's it's a great resource. We'll make sure that that's that's included. Um, Steve, I know a lot of our time is spent talking about education and and learning from you about hey, how are you learning about your kidney disease? You mentioned it's been years, almost a couple of decades, and you're continuing to learn about new aspects of your health and, yes. and navigating that care journey. I'd love to to kind of zoom in because I, there's a couple settings that, that you've been able to experience that um, I think we all can, can learn a lot more from, and many people are focused on improving, and those are dialysis and transplantation. So if you, if you could, I'd, I'd love to kind of just talk a bit more about, uh, let's start with dialysis because I know that's where your, your journey started. Um, kind of about how you found out about it, how you learned about it, and then, of course, any kind of education challenges, barriers, or what that process even looked like when you were really first going through it at age 18, 19. Yeah, absolutely. Um, back when I was going through the process of learning about dialysis, looking back, I began doing research on it, what ended up being about five or six years before I actually started, uh, what I decided to do at first, and I think a lot of people who are listening are going to understand this. I went straight to google.com. I was like, I need to know about dialysis. What does it look like? What does it feel like? What do I need to know? So I go to Google. And the only thing I really learned about dialysis through Google and looking through all these different sites was it was very scary sounding. Um, there was definitely a negative connotation over dialysis. Uh, it was something you wanted to avoid. It was something that you should try your hardest to just stay away from. And I think because of that, it scared me and it scares a lot of patients, especially those who are in stages one, two, three, um, even stage four. 
who are starting to get closer to that. So what I decided to do, because this is just my nature, I have to see things. I have to touch it. I have to feel it. That's how I learn. So I took myself, I was in graduate school and I went to a dialysis center. I just I parked my car. I walked in. I said, here's my story. I'm a patient. I will need to be on dialysis at some point, probably. Is there anybody I can just talk to to learn as much as I can? And they were very welcoming, um, which now looking back, seeing how strict it is to get back into a dialysis center. Um, I'm very fortunate that I had somebody who wanted to help me learn. And I met with a case manager. And she told me everything. Um, she talked to me about how the machines work, the importance of the machines, the importance of making sure you show up every time it's your dialysis session. She explained the different ways you can do dialysis in regards to in center, whether you have um, the fistula, which goes in your arm, or in my case, I also had the tubes, um, the catheters that came out of my chest. And then she actually took me to machine and let me feel it, touch it, learn it and understand it. And I've got to tell you, Tim, that really helped me um, because I walked out of that and I still had this feeling of it being something I didn't really want to do because who sure. would, but I felt so much better because it wasn't going to be sprung on me. I had the education and for me, education completely it can completely wipe away for me, anxiety, nerves, and fear. I think that's the, the kryptonite of fear is knowledge. And so I was really glad that I did that. Um, I also talked to my doctor. So I, I sat down with my nephrologist and he talked to me really just about home hemodialysis, not, excuse me, not home, but in center hemodialysis. Home dialysis was never even brought up. Um, and that's the truth. I was talked to about how, well, you can't really plan dialysis at times. Most of the time you're sent to the emergency room. They find out while you're there, uh oh, your kidneys are failing. They're at a level that you need dialysis quick. And so it just happens very quickly. Um, but it was never even brought up that doing this at home was even an option for me. Hmm. I, there's so many, obviously a ton of points there that you, that you brought up and I want to make sure we, hmm. we spend enough time on for, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure there are patients, there are care partners, family members who, who do, we know do listen to T minus 10. Uh, I want to make sure we, we cover this. So first and foremost, the anxiety, right? The, yep. um, uh, the environment of whether you're in dialysis or you're facing a uh, an, an illness, a diagnosis that causes you stress, and how difficult that is, as we know, to to learn when you when you feel that weight of stress. So um, I am just so impressed that, of course, we all can relate to Dr. Google, and uh, and thankfully, <laughs> new tools are coming online that are, are hopefully going to help address uh, some of that challenge of that being the first first place we turn to. But that second point of you know, getting in the car and going to a dialysis center and finding that case manager who sounds like she was wonderful and able to to not only give you a high level understanding of what to expect, but to stress the importance of of showing up to your treatments when it's your time for treatment, and then even showing you machines and getting you comfortable with, hey, it's not not so scary, and this is the device. I I love that uh, that, that framing and just that you took that upon yourself. I think talking to the doctor, I'd, I'd love to talk a bit more about the care team aspect. And um, you mentioned having the discussion with with your kidney doctor, and the home didn't didn't come up. Um, I'd be curious, just in general, given that um, you've had a pretty good relationship with different members of your care team over the years. I know some you you knew for a long time, even before you were a patient. But could you speak a bit more to the kind of the role of the care team? as someone who was taking his time and clearly a very proactive patient who wanted to understand your options. You know, number one, I want to know what advice do you have for, for having those conversations and maybe any recommendations for people listening who can understand how best to leverage their care team and the members of their care team as they're making that transition potentially onto, onto dialysis modalities. Yeah. And, that's that's a great question because patients need to remember, and I say this all the time, doctors, they, they work for you in a sense, right? Like they're on your team. And so utilize their expertise, utilize their knowledge, utilize the education that they have and go into these meetings knowing that you're the expert on you. Like I'm a professional kidney patient. So is everybody else who has it. They know their body. They know everything about themselves and the disease and how it affects them. Have that collaboration and have that conversation with your doctors 
and just sit down and say, put a, a notebook down and say, I've got 20 questions. Where do I start? And just go through that because I'm willing to bet your nephrologist, uh, the nurse practitioners, and even some of the folks at a dialysis center, if you've already started on dialysis, will sit down and answer those questions for you. Unfortunately, in this day and age, finding that time for those who are doctors, who are caretakers, and who are, let's even call them the case managers at dialysis, they have so much going on. It's not that they don't want to help you. It's sometimes they just have to be reminded. And you have to take it upon yourself as you go through the journey as a patient to make that happen. You have to put some of that responsibility on your own shoulders. Um, I know you're going through a lot. I know you're scared. I know you're worried. I was. But at the same time, if you don't take responsibility for your own journey, you're probably not going to go down the path you wish you had. And that's one of the things you don't want to do is have regrets and wish that maybe you had asked more questions um, in the long run. So definitely utilize your doctors as much as you can. Steve, thank you. I, I think that uh, that takeaway is, is so important. It's a two-way street and you're going to get out of your care what you put into it. And if you come prepared right. and you have questions and you know you are proactive, uh, those reminders help those those prompts to your care team to have the right questions to be able to say, hey, this is the kind of information I need support with right now. That's what's going to help you longer term. And, and I want to take that that same recommendation and kind of bring it with us into another care setting in the transplantation, post-transplant. I know that's another topic, another area where you've expressed to me in the past that, you know, that there, there were some unexpected turns and, and you wish you could have been either more informed or better prepared. Could you give us an idea of, of kind of what was entailed and maybe some of those, those obstacles you face in the, in that part of the journey? Yeah. And, and looking back, I had my transplant done at Vanderbilt in Nashville, Tennessee. And, and I want to say the team that I have, and I still have a Vanderbilt, is phenomenal. But when I look back at the weeks leading up to the actual transplant, I remember one specific conversation, um, and it was a very short conversation. And they said, it's important for us to know that you understand that this is not a cure, that this is a form of treatment. Well, I, I kind of, I had that understanding. I, I knew that, but I, I wasn't fully aware, like I wish now I'd have asked more questions of exactly what it could look like post-transplant. Okay, so you're not going to have an immune system. Well, what does that mean? And so coming off of a transplant, the, I would say the first three, four years, four or five years were pretty good. They were very non-eventful, and that's a great thing, <laughs> post-transplant. But then all of a sudden, I started getting sick all the time and was getting um, infections, was getting the flu. Um, bronchitis so easily. And I'm learned it's because of the medicine I'm taking and it wiping away my immune system. And because of that, well, guess what happens? Then you start dealing with that kind of stuff. And so that kind of threw me for a loop. It threw me for a loop and I was not expecting that. And I'll be frank, at the beginning, it kind of brought me down a little bit. I'm like, well, hold on a second. You know, why am I still going to a hospital? Why am I still having to do this and that? I, you know, I had that transplant. Um, but mm -hmm. I wish I would have had more questions to ask. I wish I had more resources back then. So I would have fully understood exactly what it could look like. And I emphasize could look like because everybody's journey is different. Thank you. Yeah, this is, uh, this is so helpful. So obviously my, my first, my first reaction question is, all right, well, what, what are you doing now? So it, this, it sounds like you kind of made this transition into, all right, this is a, a new reality that I didn't fully understand when they, and they first told me this is this is not a cure. This is a treatment. Um, how are you, the Steve, who's been who's faced multiple care settings over the last nineteen years? What have you come to learn about how how you learn, how you educate yourself, and then where are you finding as you're making these trips into unexpected trips in many cases to the hospital, dealing with different uh, illnesses here and there? What is your go to for how you're preparing yourself for for that journey? Yeah. Honestly, one of the best resources I'm using right now is my time that I'm spending within the hospitals and within my doctors because I've learned from my past of not asking those questions and of not paying as much attention as I should have. Even though I do feel like I am somebody who is more proactive than, than a lot. Um, and I've told you this, I kind of have jokingly told you when I go to the hospital, it's more like a case study. 
And I mean, I'm paying attention to everything. Anytime there's a nurse shift change, I want them in front of, in front of me when they're talking about what's going on. I want the doctors to come in. I want to be a part of those conversations. I ask to be, I am constantly asking questions. I'm a very proactive patient. Um, I don't just lay there in my bed and wait for the, the illness to kind of move on so I can go back home. I'm extremely active, an active learner in the hospital. And I, I, I know hospitals are dreary. I know nobody wants to be there, but you have got to make the best of your situation. There's mm -hmm. nothing I can do. I was blessed with a transplant. Well, a part of that is I'm going to get sick some and I'm going to have to go to a hospital. Well, that's, that's never really going to change. But what can change is how I take advantage of that and how I can use that to not just better myself and better educate myself, but to also help other people and have amazing people like you who give me this opportunity. And, and I know I've said this to you before, Tim, I would have given anything if I'd have had you and Icona around back when I was learning about dialysis, because I mean, let's talk virtual reality, just even in that aspect of learning and the ability in the way that you learn is night and day compared to me just walking in a dialysis center. I, I it's endless, the resources that you can try to find out there now. And I cannot thank people like you enough. And I've told you this um, for what that you do. And I know down the road, I'm probably going to need another transplant. And it makes me feel more comfortable knowing that I have these resources. I have this comfort that's there. that's going to be waiting for me this time. Instead of me going into a blind, trying to find everything that I can and not really knowing where to look, how to look or anything like that. Well, Steve, every time I, every time we chat, I, I'm so full of energy and appreciation. And I, I, your attitude says everything about you and your perspective on, on everything you've, you've been through. And I, I just appreciate you so much. And, and thank you for the, the kind words. I would also be remiss not to say, you know, your story and your DNA is, is in the Icona solution. Like it exists because of our conversations years ago. So um, I hope, I hope you know that like that is what contributed to to that tool for other patients. And obviously our, our job is to make it better every single day with every single experience and to capture as many of these stories as we can and bring them to be on demand and experiential and immersive for other patients who are understanding their care path. So thank you. And uh, I, as we're kind of thinking about wrapping up here, I, sure. I do want to encourage people listening, people watching, you know, when Steve talks about spending time doing case studies in hospitals, you know, he means that. And if you if you follow him at all, I encourage you, whether it's LinkedIn and I'm not sure where else, we'll make sure Steve tells us where to find his work. But he is an active writer, storyteller, um, constantly you know, sharing gratitude for his nurses and the people who care for him, but also highlighting his experiences and what's going on and what he's learning. Uh, and I think in in today's age where we can democratize the way we share stories and write and the internet exists for this very reason. Yeah. The best way for a lot of patients to learn is, is from other patients. Yes. And so Steve, I think you know, I have to say the same to you. Thank you for teaching me and always sharing freely with your story because it's, you know, it, it goes such a long way. It's not just for patients. It's for all of us who are trying to improve this, this team aspect, mm -hmm. right? This, the care team, so those of us building solutions and those of us who are just in the community trying to advocate for one another. So it goes both ways and I appreciate it. I'd love to, I'd love to kind of finish this off with the reasons for optimism. You know, you are already someone who's very optimistic and you, um, despite it all, you find reasons to, to be excited, to, uh, to have a positive attitude. I'd love to hear uh, what, what you're optimistic about when it comes to education, where, kidney care is headed, you know, reasons for optimism, given that all you see on a day-to-day -day basis and, and obviously all of our conversations in the past. Yeah, there is a lot of reason to be optimistic if you're a patient right now, because like I had mentioned, um, not only were there not a ton of resources dedicated to kidney disease, let's be honest with ourselves. Kidney disease is not that attractive disease, right? Um, we are and I said, we are a disease that when you look at it, you just, you can't see it. You can't tell. So it's really hard to get people to buy into that emotionally to understand what it is a patient goes through, whether that's through dialysis or it's a day-to-day -day as a stage three patient, whether it's a transplant patient. And so what I'm seeing happening now is we're seeing 
places like Icona popping up and doing absolutely wonderful things. It's finally getting the attention that it's always deserved. And that is so, so exciting because, yeah, I may have this ability to share my story and do my writing and things on LinkedIn. But if I do something on LinkedIn and I share my story and then somebody like, you know, Tim, like yourself or Icona responds to that or they share that, oh, my goodness, it's taken that platform and just expanded it to so many different people. Whereas before, let's even call it 10 years ago, if I'd have written something on Facebook or LinkedIn about my kidney journey, it probably wouldn't have half as much care as it does today. And that's really, really inspiring to me. Um, and I, I implore patients to, to, to know that what you're going through is difficult. Uh, it's not easy, but look around you, look how many more people care than they used to. And that should be a very, very exciting thing for everybody. Thank you, Steve. I'm, I'm optimistic to, um, talking to patients, you know, I'm uh, not a kidney patient myself, but patient and spend a lot of time in a hospital and, um, I've always just found the most inspiration from hearing people around me, beside me, with me, who, who have been been through it and continue to go through it, and are looking for that grain of a reason to be to continue to keep to keep pushing. Uh, however, we can share that story and that platform is is why it exists. And you know, one of the wanted to add on to a point you made about it's really hard to tell if someone might be battling kidney disease in particular as one that isn't as obvious and doesn't have optically something uh, that other diseases might have. Well, kidney disease happens to have so much else along, along with it. And if your you know, mental health care, for example, is something that you've uh, been able to talk about and been brave to share your story in a lot of our webinars, I think that is the combination of all of these tides coming together at the same time is what's allowing us to kind of have this conversation in the first place and to bring in some of these advocacy groups that have existed for decades in some cases, but are finally seeing, hey, we have yeah. common ground and there's no reason we should be in our silos for, for a single disease when we really are all kind of impacted by some similar threads in, in, in the same struggle here. So I'm optimistic for, for this reason too. Um, there's a whole lot more work to be done and we will do it and we are excited to because uh the more we the more we do together the more patients we seem to meet the more stories and people are sharing with you with me about how we're helping just by giving them the strength to share their own story so uh steve thank you for thank you for joining me on t minus 10 it's it's long overdue you are the first uh first of many patient stories who will be on on this show. And, and I just can't thank you enough for joining us. Thank you so, so much. It's a definitely an honor. Uh, and I, I thank you again. I won't go through it all again, but thank you, Tim. Seriously, from a patient, not just a friend and a coworker, but as a patient, thank you. My pleasure, Steve. Where, um, let's, let's wrap this up here. Where can people find you, get a hold of you if they want to reach out and, and get to know you? Um, where can they find you? What's the best place to get a hold of you? Yeah. Um, right now, LinkedIn, and you can find me under Stephen Winfrey um, is probably the number one resource I use now. I, I find it to be um, lining up best with what my mission is, what I'm trying to do. I am also on Facebook. My wife and I have a page together called Steve and Heather Winfrey, where you can follow along where my wife and I, as you had mentioned, we had gone viral. Our story has been seen over 700 million times worldwide. And because of that, um, we were offered a book deal and we signed a movie deal of all things. And so if you want to keep track of that and keep track of the behind the scenes and how all that stuff works for just two ordinary people, um, please, please join us there on Facebook, Steve and Heather Winfrey. Amazing. Steve, thank you again for joining me on T-10. We'll make sure all of that is in the show notes uh, and excited to, to stay in touch and continue learning from you. Yeah. Thank you so much.